Hey everyone, it's Jeremy Barker with 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast, and today we have Evan Fitzgerald and his beautiful wife, Sarah. We are doing a little touch base, and I just wanted to hear how they were doing. He's he's still upright, which is awesome. He's still uh, fighting the battle that a lot of us haven't had to fight, but stay tuned. we got a great story, so thank you again for listening. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, and don't settle. Hey, this is Houston. We're copying. Uh, everything is go here. We shall fight on the beaches. And in the streets, we shall never surrender. I'm in it just to rewrite history, cause I'm in the mood to label us the leaders of the leaders of the new school. This ain't for the radio, can't find this on YouTube. This the type of killing that these critics say you used to. You're a group of happy rebels. You've said no to the rules of the game or the regulations of the day. You've said no to the conventional wisdom. You're all originals. Yeah, thank you for having us. We are excited to be here with you. You've been such an amazing support to me and our family, a quiet one, and uh, you've always been there. And so we're excited to have this conversation and see where it goes. Awesome. Sarah? But it's your first time here. Yeah, first you time. You got this giant mic in your face. I'm going <laughs> to deal with it. Like, what do I it's do okay. with it? Fine. You can kind of back, push it forward if you'd like. Anyhow, so <laughs> I guess it's probably been, what, three years? Is it right in the middle of COVID? When did we visit last, Evan? It was probably around then. It feels like a forever ago. But, yeah, a lot has happened since then. Yeah, fill me in. Like, so last time we visited, you were you were still trying to figure it out, looking for doctors that could really work on the lung side, I think. Yeah, so to catch up on all my medical stuff, it's uh, it's progressed and gotten worse. Um, my lungs are hardening, uh, the cartilage in my lungs, and it's going up into my throat, and so it messes with my ability to talk, and, and um, I have to consciously breathe a lot, uh, which means that I have a lot of restriction in my lungs, and it feels almost like concrete that I need to break open over time. Is and that, that every morning or is that throughout the it's day? It's throughout the day, All constantly. Day and sometimes I can't get my lungs to open completely. Yeah. And that just leads into like this air hunger and, and anxiety that I had to figure out how to deal with. And at the time I met with you last time, I haven't, I didn't uh, really get into that as much as I needed to, which is why my life was so chaotic at that moment. Um, and so after three years of buckling down and just sitting with myself, sitting with the pain and trying to be with it. I've uh, learned really that there's this air hunger and then there's this anxiety. So there's pain that was intertwined, you know, with a lot of uh, emotional type stuff. So over time, I've been able to kind of separate that out and it's helped me be more present with my family and aware of them and not just caught up in my pain. So a lot of things have gotten better in relation to what life is all about, you know, and showing Start up. narrowing in what focus, what yeah. you need to focus on. Yeah. So I think people take for granted, you know, running on an ambulance back, back and forth, breathing problems are mm. always something you look at someone, your sat levels are high, dude, calm down. Mm -hmm. You have this anxiety going on and you mm -hmm. don't understand the patient a lot. Yeah. I do just breathe. You're fine. You're, you're, you're sat and fine. You don't have to have this anxiety issue you're having and be mm -hmm. frustrating a little bit. Until you have one. Exactly. Until you can't breathe. And I had that after. I'm like, what is this freaking anxiety attack I'm having? I've never had one of this. Just from like a little chest pain or I felt like I couldn't catch my breath. And it was something stupid. And then as soon as I calmed down, it was fine. I ran down to the fire station, put a 12 lead on me. And I'm like, well, this is just fine. Mm. I don't know why I'm freaking out. What's going on? And my sat levels were 99. I'm like, I don't understand the whole anxiety thing. And once I saw it in my own, with my own eyes yeah. on the monitor, I calmed down. But I, I think we take it for granted a lot when we're sitting on the truck. But yeah. I think as before we get too far in, for those of us that haven't heard the whole story, you don't need to kind of go through the very beginning, but I, I think it would be helpful to kind of refresh yeah. everyone as far as what had happened initially and kind of bring people up to speed for the ones that oh, yeah. haven't heard the story. Yeah. I think it'd be quite helpful just to hit that those points. For sure, yeah, I'm happy to review all that. And I just, uh, I think uh, Sarah also fill in to some of the gaps. Um, I think it's important to get both of our perspectives because it's been a journey that I think could could help other people that are in similar situations. So that's one of the main reasons we wanted to come. Um, I kind of consider where I'm at in life uh, like a low battery mode, you know, where you can only have a few applications on your phone at a time. And so I, I prioritize my life in a way where 
I've had to kind of step away from relationships, from groups of people and, and really narrow in on the family and what's important. So I appreciate this opportunity to reach out to everybody and, and say that, you know, that I'm still here. I, I think about all the friends and family, fire family all the time. And, and it's an honor to be able to, to reach out in this way. So, um, okay. So to start from the beginning, uh, I think it might be helpful just to even go all the way back um, to the childhood trauma that sure, led me into the 100%. job. Because when I was a kid, I was seven. My dad, he, he died on our farm. Um, it was a tractor accident. And I go through this in that last podcast, but uh, it was a uh, terrible day, but it opened me up in a lot of ways. I started seeing the world completely different at a young age. Um, and one of the things that stuck with me after that day was the people that showed up um it, they couldn't do anything but they were there they were ready and they tried their best and despite uh, their efforts they couldn't help you know my dad broke his neck it was an instant death um but my brother uh he he was the one that found him and he wasn't going to give up and so he kept fighting you know for them to resuscitate and it physically even attacked one of them as they were walking away and how old was he how old was your brother he was 11 he was 11 yeah um so that day just sat with me you know and i've, I've reflected on it a lot as you can imagine um, but one of the things that built in me was a, a respect for the people that showed up and a, a love for them so I wanted to be like that. Um, so I followed all the, the people that represented that in my life. I started as, as a volunteer as soon as I could. Um, and a lot of that uh, was to be somebody that um, my kids could see as honorable. Uh, I wanted to show up in the world that, in a way that gave them an example of, of how they could also be the good, you know, in the world. And, um, so I tried to tried to be that, and then um, after working at uh, Northview Fire, North Ogden, and then Salt Lake City, I I went out on a deployment with City um, to California, and uh, we were putting out spot fires, and there was a tree that was on fire, and we tried to test it to see if it was sturdy, and it turned out it wasn't, and that cracked after we put some water on it and I was underneath it at that time and because we were putting out fire um, that it had put out around it um, and it knocked me out and ragdolled me down this 200 foot cliff and landed face down on burning fire like a uh, campfire is the way my partner described it I was unconscious and he pulled me off and um, I didn't come to for like aware for a, a minute uh, around that after and I was not fully conscious for a few hours after that. And being reckless as a kid uh, just put me in a place where I wasn't recovering. And um, at this time, I was a, a husband and a father. And and, uh, and that was kind of when everything started to unravel and my health started to deteriorate and my mind almost um, was lost. It, it was a very, very rough time. It was unbelievably tough. And well, you go from invincible, super strong, super fit. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> and then all of a sudden to where you feel like you or where you can't, mm -hmm. where you feel like there's nothing that can stop you yeah. in your heart. And then all of a sudden find yourself where you can't even breathe for mm -hmm. your, on your own. Right? Yeah. So I can see why you would build up some of the anxiety oh and yeah man. well yeah just uh, limited in my capacity to do things uh, limited in my ability to show up as as a man right and as a, a husband and a father luckily sarah's been very supportive but she can tell you that i, I came home a different person yeah <laughs> This is crazy. My body has like so many emotions. I'm like trying not to cry. It feels like surreal in the weirdest way to even that this is our life. But yeah, um, from the moment he walked in the door, it was a complete different energy. Like in his eyes, I could see he was different and I didn't, I didn't, wasn't ready. I don't know if you're ever ready for something like that. I didn't quite understand the hell we would walk through in that given moment. Um, it's been like a lot 
I'm not going to cry on here. Okay, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> no, but um, it it really was kind of just like a brand new person coming in and like you're supposed to have this life with them. And it was, it was a stranger. It was the craziest thing. So yeah, that we concussion. went through a lot and yeah, I had to kind of, I mean, we got to the point, not just divorce, but like I had, I hated him. I, then I felt nothing for him, which I think was the scarier. Like I would think I would have rather t- like keep hating him than feel nothing. I didn't really um, care. And then like we slowly, you know, fell back in love and it was, you know, lucky for us, it was a good thing, but I think it's very rare to happen and to go through that sort of like hard. So there is hope for others that are struggling. (laughs) How many years ago was that again? What year was that? 2017. So pushing seven years, I guess. It's wild to even think about. Yeah. Um, Because what had happened was basically my mind, I was just reset. Like I, um, that concussion, did a number on me and it took a lot to get me back into a place where I can have a conversation about it, where I can sit here and not have anxiety and feel like I need to defend myself when my wife expresses how it's hurt her because it's just, it's, it's what's happened to us. And it, and we've gotten to a place where we're not blaming it on each other anymore. It just is what it is. And we're trying to make the best of it. And uh, so after I got hurt and I knew things were getting bad like my lungs were hurting like it started every other week and then it's worked up to now constantly but in the meantime after that injury you did go back to work though right i did kind of Mm -hmm. the phase oh i tried to man i tried to work i tried to ignore it i tried Tried to to pretend like it wasn't there i tried to keep working out but it was just destroying me everything that i did had a huge cost physically and mentally how long did you work after your accident um so i've been (laughs) retired three years so i tried uh, was like I was years. gradually getting pretty sick. The concussion was a big deal as far as relationship with my wife and my kids. And, and But as far as showing up, I think that's where I went to kind of numb out and just zone in and work on that Fit to Respond, Fit to Retire program, which is the health and wellness program we built for uh, fire, firefighters to support firefighters, but also just first re- responders in general um, to support them in their purpose. Um, and luckily, building that actually helped create a lot of awareness and um, uh, I guess a structure to help me move through the mental. For your own thing. You yeah, build it. Mind it helps you. Yeah, it, it's pretty stuff. pretty wild. It's all ironic, right? The program Fit to Respond, Fit to Retire. And I'm now medically retired and seeing things from this side. And the perspective that I gained is is why I feel like I need to show up right now and and why I'm prioritizing this is important because it is really important to to reach out and to help because there's a huge need still, huge need. And people are struggling, then we get calls all the time and not just about the the fire side of things, which is it's brutal what's happening with people and, and how they're handling the job, but also people that are dealing with chronic illness. We've spoken out a few times and there's just so many people in the dark, just in pain, feeling alone, trying to just survive, keep their head above water, because this this sort of thing in our current environment, as far as the political medical system, it doesn't support people with obscure diseases at all, to be honest. It, it really is stigmatized um, and autoimmune is kind of, a lot of what's happening is autoimmune, but there's also the small airway disease, um, but it's all convoluted and it's not obvious when you see me. So that, that created a lot of internal uh, struggle. I, like the job told me I was crazy. The doctors were trying to tell me I was crazy when I was in the middle of a divorce. And Your wife's I, saying you're crazy. And, 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 and <laughs> in some ways right. I was, uh, right. clearly. But he looks clearly. healthy, you know. Right. Yeah, so. Well, he's, you're not near as <laughs> fit as you used to. Well, no, we're, fit, no for sure. He's body size. But like doctors say, are like, you look fine, you look. And sure. it's like. They, well, they don't know, right? They don't yeah, know. They don't know. know. Exactly. And then your team members don't know what you're feeling. It's hard to express internal injury, not mm-hmm. just not just physical internal injury, but. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's just a whole bunch that goes with right. it. So you exacerbate a problem from health. Mm-hmm. And then internally you start trying to struggle your own way through and justifying and improving yourself and not understanding why you can't do what you used to be able to do. Yep. And that's, 
that's a really frustrating component. Yeah. Even sure? I mean, I had my I broke my back what 2016, mm-hmm. and I still catch myself like oh, I'll just go grab that. The next thing you know, I was at Costco with my mother and a bag of chips oh, right wow. to the ground just because <laughs> you twist wrong, right? Oh my so gosh. you break T7 and herniate L3, four and five. And then I got my sternum. I, I don't know if you remember that, but it was the, the year before. And I'm like, man, this is no big deal. And your doctor said, hey, this is a forever. Mm. And I'm like, well, no, it's not. I've had injuries like this before. It's not forever. This isn't a big deal. We'll work through it. It just hurts for a while. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it does challenge what you really can do. And oh, you man. don't remember what you can't do. And you don't mm. want to remember that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I've had a hard time going back to the stations and, and being with the crews because it, it really is a life that I can't live anymore. And it's so painful to be there. And it actually, um, that conflict in my mind put me in a suicidal place for a long time where I honestly couldn't shake the suicidal thoughts and they were just intrusive. They would just come and I wasn't actively seeking that, you know, I, I was trying to heal. I was trying to recover, but my mind was working very hard to try to find a way out, right? And that's what people do. They, they forget that it's temporary. And even with me, what's happening is it's constant, right? In one, in one sense. But when I sit with it and I allow the pain to be what it is, it, it moves, it changes, and it's not as constant as I once thought it was. Um, but it took me a long, long time to get to the point to be able to detach from it to to make what I've been subject to an object in my awareness so that I could not be subject to it anymore. Right. So I didn't act out of that pain. And so I didn't show up as my pain and that's how I was for a long time. And that's why uh, it almost led to divorce. But you've always been like a studious person and very consciously aware of your physical, you know, health as well as your mental health. So then how do you take someone that isn't as aware and make them learn that they can also be empowered to take over their mental thought that's taking over them, right? Yeah. So they haven't had the exercise, the mental exercises that you've had since you were seven. Like you've had to learn how to deal with those life-changing environments mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't ever have to deal with ever inside their mind. So then they find themselves suddenly depressed, suddenly suicidal from something that could be a fault of their own or not a fault of their own. Mm-hmm. But how would you, I mean, not that you have the answer, but some of the thing is, how would you suggest to people to try to figure out how to get from step A to step B without saying step A is I don't feel good about myself, I want to kill myself, to step B is executing your mindset, right? And, mm. and just to try to get rid of the pain. We all know it's a short-lived deal. I've been in the suicidal play twice, I tried. And ultimately, I did, wasn't successful, thank goodness to yeah, thank friends God. around me. But at the same time, at that point, it was like there was no solution that could be better than that yeah that's all we that's all we can think about that's it's it's completely you know centric you find yourself and that is the only thought and you're like well you can't think like that and it's hard when you're running on a rescue i can sympathize at some point when you show up and you're like hey suicidal hey man this will pass i promise yeah and that guy's like yeah it did for you but you don't understand me yeah right like it's really hard to get them to switch yeah how do you get people to change their mind or how do you what would be some little bits of advice that I guess you found that brought, I guess, at least pause mm-hmm. to the mindset of that is the answer? Because I yeah. think pause is all you need, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then exactly. you give pause, and that's all you have to have is that two-second pause, mm-hmm. and then four-second pause, 10-second pause, 60-second yeah, exactly. pause. Exactly. So what that's were those it. exercises? Well, I have a thought, but maybe you want to have say uh, what you think. Well, so I've had only been like I suicidal like one time and it was because of like our situation I do think it's going to be different for everybody right um not everyone has a support system because I think they do have to decide it's like you can try everything but you're not going to save your this person right they have to choose to save themselves um I don't think I have the perfect thing to say something that like helped me was just It's like cliche, but like your why, like why you get, why do you get up in the morning? For me, mine is my kids. I'm like, my goal in life is to be a mom. It's something that's just been driven inside me. I don't feel like I even chose it. I feel like it chose me. So when I was like in this dark place, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't get a divorce because I don't want him to have the kids because he's crazy. I love you. But like, this is like my, in my inner thoughts. Right. And I'm like, I just, there's no way. And then it's just like, whatever, not logical thinking, but, um, it was, 
that kind of it was just a few minutes and then I had a good friend and I was just like oh my gosh I'm not in a good place and we just cried and let it out together but again I would say choose those people that you can have that person to call like when you're, you're not, nothing no shame nothing to be embarrassed about be like I'm just not well I can't I need you and I need you now and they just that person showed up I think he had a lot of so. different people like that um and then just like God like mm-hmm. I tried to deny that one <laughs> many times, but just little, you know, little, small little moments would just come up and I'm like, okay, thank you. This is real, <laughs> even though I try to make it not. Um, so that's something that yeah. helped me, but I don't know. What I do love you? That. I, I think relationship and maintaining relationships is vital to, to staying healthy in those situ- or <coughs> surviving, I should say, in those situations. Um, but I like what you said too, Jeremy. There's there's a quote that I love that I u- actually used in our fit to respond, fit to retire program. When we were teaching firefighters how to uh, be aware and to build rapport. Um, it, it comes ahead of time. All that rapport that you're trying to build to have a relationship with the person that you're trying to help. It, it's not in the moment that you show up and like, hey, with a smile on your face. It's all of those moments before that you interacted, um, and and part of that lesson was finding that space because you have to have that awareness to to be with somebody before they're going to trust you because people don't care what you know until they know that you care right and and so Viktor Frankl um was a guy who was in uh he was a psychiatrist I believe and he was in Auschwitz and he came away with just incredible wisdom and this little nugget has helped me so much throughout my life He said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies your freedom. That's paraphrased. Um, So what you said about lengthening that space between the stimulus and how we respond to that is key. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to build that up before you're able to to step back and be like, "I I am in a bad place. To recognize that you're in a bad place is the first step. Right. And you feel it in your body, you feel it in how you're at interacting with one another, you're, the people you love, how you're treating them. And that's going to reflect where you're headed and um, hopefully prevent you from getting into a suicidal, you know, place. But once you're there, um, some some mindfulness practice to help widen that, that space helps you know that you need to call somebody. Um, so I could get into a little bit of more of the details of a practice that actually we even did today, but um, I don't know. It's up to you. I think the exercise comes, well, we'll get into that okay. for sure, but I think the exercise of the pause when you're in the space has to be consecutive in a row, and that's where it becomes difficult. Like, I'm going to pull the trigger or I'm going to do whatever you're going to do. Um, one second, no. And then now you have to create a two-second no and then a four-second no, and then to the point where you can at least walk away to delay that action. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the struggle and the skill set comes into because it's like, to your point, like Viktor Frankl, is that what you said his name? Mm -hmm. Um, To his pause, it's that space in the middle. And I think what we lack is the ability to understand, and especially now where everything's so immediate, Mm -hmm. that we can have a desire and we're going to have what we want right now without having to have a pause. The faster the internet, the That's faster true. the phone line, the faster it is. So now yeah. we're responding in three to five second reels. You get to see that. You get to go on to the mm-hmm. next. You get to do whatever, right? If you're looking yeah. for a lawnmower, like it was right. there, you can see 100 yeah. in two seconds. That's, that's an important point. So, yeah, I think it's really important to, to recognize where our awareness is going because it is kind of a commodity now, and it's being sold. Um, so if we're just giving it away freely, we're not going to have it tuned up and ready in the moment when you have to have when pause, you have to have it and that's when you have to learn patience and yep. i think the sad part about whether whether it be human race whether it be per people that want to have a family or have somebody that loves them or have the, you know their relationship to be better i mean yours mm-hmm. took a while it yeah. wasn't like it was oh, a 30 rough. day deal or a right. 60 day pause we've all had our relationship issues and i think anybody that's going to have a relationship for any amount of times going to have struggle and whilst we hope is that our partner is stronger than us in the opposite times, times right exactly. it's just when we both are weak at the same time that becomes dangerous yeah right because yeah. then all of a sudden there's neither party not only do you 
question if you love them, but then you get to the point where you don't like them and then to the point where you don't care at all. Mm. Like, uh, whatever. Where are they? Don't care. Yeah. Not really caring. Apathetic. Yeah. Well, are they going to show up? Don't care. And truly like you wish you could find that. But at the same time, it's like, okay, well don't just jump to that immediate action too. And I think currently the quicker we get our response to the desire, the faster we want the response to every desire or that we can't learn with the the quiet peace in the center Mm -hmm. and, or to, it lengthened that quiet piece. Yeah. So you're in there. I, I don't like the way I'm feeling right now. I'm going to shut it down. I mean, I went on a call that was about a kid that got his, you know, his Nintendo or whatever it was that was taken away and bef- literally walked from church and done. And it was 14 years old over a Nintendo, right? I mean, mm. for heaven's sakes, it's, it's that immediate. Like I can't see past tomorrow of not having my game. And I mean, I sympathize with that family tremendously. If that, if that's somebody that's here, that I understand oh, it. Yeah. But at, at the same time, you know, we, we want something now and it can be in love. It can be in marriage. It can be in business. You're like, I just want to be this tomorrow. And they don't understand the building and the pause and the patience. And it, it relates to, I think, most things in life that people are trying to understand. And we try to understand every day. I'm trying like, well, I want this tomorrow. This is what I want. Yeah. And then, of course, the goal setting and the benchmarking of goals is super important. Like, we've been trying to do this as a company internally, understanding and setting a good goal and making sure that the goals have check marks along the way and to make sure our heading's in the right direction for the goal that we're going after. And I think currently in some of our goal setting problems or strategies is we'll say, I want to do this for tomorrow or what's best for tomorrow. Mm. But then we don't realize that if you can set that goal further out, say a 10 year objective, and that's a really hard one to see. I did some personal professional and financial interviews with my guys in Kentucky last week. I sat down with every single employee for, and I guess the longest one was about two hours, but everything in the middle of zero to two hours. The shortest one was probably in the 30 to 45 minutes. But ultimately, a lot of them are just like, well, what's your goal? Well, 10 years from now, I have no idea, but I'm hoping to get to lunch on time. Like, truly, it's going to be, that's the goal. Like, mm. hopefully we're done by exactly. 3.30. I'm like, well, why are we at work? And then trying to expand their objective, you know, of where they want to be in life. And I think if we can push that objective and understand that there's going to be peaks and valleys, and I mm-hmm. guess the best way to I describe this, and, I, and I'm using this little bit of a paraphrase inside a suicidal mindset, which I know is probably extremely backwards. But um, if I use the example of trying to go to New York, to L, from New York to L.A., but if we go out the front door and our objective is just to go to McDonald's for lunch, but our true desire is to end up in L.A., which I don't know why you'd want to go to L.A., by the mm. way. Anyway, <laughs> but let's just pretend like we did care, you know, because yeah. it was in the 80s. And then uh, we were trying to get there, but we only looked at lunch, and then we just got to McDonald's, but inside our deep subconscious mindset, that's truly what we wanted. Yeah, no, I man, what you're saying right? is, is so key. But what's the fastest way? So yeah. I'd say you want to go to New York to to freaking New Guinea or I mean honestly if your goal is LA you're going the wrong way yeah so if we say hey this is our long-term objective yeah and then it's okay the, what's the fastest way there well you're going to hit 80 and you're going to just go to 80 yep. and then you're going to hit I-15 and down and you're going to be there well the problem is is you can get there through several different ways you can even go backwards yeah. and still get to where your objective is however there's much easier ways like 80 to 15 yeah. and then yeah you can get some frontage roads exits and hit a like a hotel that may be a little bit off Mm-hmm. your path so what you're talking keep tight yeah you're talking about purpose the there sense of go. purpose the, the why mm-hmm. and and without that we're aimless and i think it is so key uh if we don't have that um in our forefront of our mind uh daily if we're not thinking about what we have what we're grateful for you know and and w- where we want to take what we have then yeah and who do we want to take with us yep right? so so that's what I exactly. So that's what uh, was the purpose of fit to respond, fit to retire. So my hope was to help people maintain their sense of meaning and purpose that drove them into the job, um, because it's so easily snatched away by the the nature of it. The fact that it just robs us of sleep, you know, and there's a lot of trauma and, and all sorts of things that uh, destabilize that foundation that you're talking about, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I think maintaining that, but also um, being open to that expanding and, and changing, right? Because what happened with me and Sarah was we had this great plan. 
I thought firefighting was a sure way to yeah, to take care of my family. Off, yeah, yeah to, to be a good example to my kids. To if I got hurt, they would take care of us. You know, all of the things. I thought it was a safe bet. Well, and I think something like why that's so important is before it happens. So, like, you want to play offense. I think before you want to play defense. Like, you want to have this plan. You want to teach the firefighters. We want to teach our kids these things before they need it. Right? Life's hard. We don't know what's coming. I didn't know he was going to have an accident and. Our life is going to be flipped upside down. So kind of preparing people, like you don't know what if your mom's going to die or your sister's going to get in a car. Like this is this is life. We don't know. But having the mindset, having the tools, like when you are needing it and you have something to grasp to, I think is super important. And that's why the stuff he wants to teach that he's like, oh, yes, we've used it and it's helped us. But you also want to share it because, you know, like that story you just told about that 14 year old boy i'm a mom of three boys and i'm like oh my gosh my heart's breaking and it's real and it's reality and it's unfortunate but i wish that little boy had like something to be like okay this is actually not as big as it seems right now right yeah like perspective is huge anyway and that, that just problem made me think of that. no i love it and that problem i think is our problem that 14 year old doing what he did is our problem society and and how we're showing up as adults showing him what's important how to find your worth, all of those things lead into this. And that, that's that got to be in our why. That's got to be in our priorities and our, our uh, purpose. Um, and then when things like this happen to us, those core things are the still point, the center that you were talking about that we should be kind of revolving around. And then as things get crazy, we, we go back to that center of really who we are and who we've always been and let that guide to the next point. My mom used to call it bored. You're only bored if you're boring. So we'd find ourselves <laughs> bored, but it's the quiet time that we've yeah. eliminated in our life, the bored time. And we use all this electronics and gaming and whatever it is. I, I don't play those, but I do play on my phone or whatever, right? And so you just don't have that quiet pie, a piece of mind where you can just kind of dig into something. And Space. I think that quiet time is so important. And I think when you're running through those depressive parts of your life, to recognize and appreciate a little bit of the mindset, because you're not listening to anything else. The only thing you're listening to is this voice like, end the quiet, or yeah. end the depression, or end the sadness. And I think what you nailed for yourself is that you figured out how to embrace the, the bad feelings and the quiet, and the, yeah. the, the lack of ability to take control of what you've been able to control your whole life. You could no longer decide, I'm gonna go, you know, apply at Salt Lake City and I'm going to do everything that it takes and I'm going to get the job in a highly competitive department and knowing that you can do it. Now you have to do a reality check saying I can't do any of them. Yeah. Like not even a volunteer department at this truth stage, of it, man. which is truly, probably be truly hard. Now I look at it and I look at these kids and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I even want to go back to work because uh, I don't know if we can even tell the same stories. I'm not into talking about Nintendo. Yeah. Like I have no idea. I mean, not to downplay, but they're so young. I mean, here we sit, I'll be 50 in freaking August. Can you believe that crap? Wow. I know. You know how to say it like that. <laughs> right? So 50, you look <laughs> I, I look 49. <laughs> I know because I still am. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Just kidding. That's it. So anyway, I'm... I, I really feel for people that have this quiet peace. And, you know, my wife currently, she had her mom, she got into, an, she got a nasal infection in August, a sinus infection, I should mm. say. And then it pushed up into her brain and she oh, was no. in and out of ICU for the last six months up until uh, January 26th, I believe, when it finally killed her. And mm. uh, so from a sinus infection to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome, you know, di dialysis, and she was wow. going in and out of care centers. She's going to be fine. I can't believe it turned out to, she's not going to make it another 24 hours mm. to, I can't believe she pulled through. This is crazy. Back yeah. to, and it was just back and forth. And I think watching my wife suffer through some of that stuff has been really hard. Yeah. I mean, it's been an elongated, it's not just the loss of your your mother, oh, right? Yeah. So it's not that she's been, she passed away two months ago, roughly, right? Just about three months, I guess. Well, two and a half. And then to see, you know, we've been, she's been living it for six already. Yeah. Right. But six months of, oh, I can talk to my mom to, well, I don't yeah. think she's going to pull through tomorrow. 
to, oh, she's back, and then have her ask for a chocolate Wendy's Frosty, right? It's, oh, it's just been this cycle, and to see her not even understand and try to find new meaning yeah. when it, we didn't find it to be, when I say we didn't find it to be, it wasn't set necessarily the core, like going around mom or dad mm -hmm. or relatives or immediate family and extended family was not necessarily the core of our daily purpose. Yeah. But then quickly finding herself reeling in to find it be truly a core purpose of hers and trying to also understand what is she going through? Why is she acting so sad? I mean, I get yeah. it, but mo your mom's been going through this for so long mm -hmm. and to kind of recenter again saying, Hey man, it isn't all about how frustrating you're being to me right now. It's, it's truly, what is she going through and trying exactly. to find the ability to be understanding and appreciative yeah. of that is truly hard. Yeah. Uh, you so, know, yeah. from the spouse side. And right. then, you know, you can feel it and you can see him visibly hurt. Mm -hmm. And then of course hurt turns into what type of emotional response. Yeah. Anger, right? So then you're like, why are you being such a bitch? I yeah. wish you weren't being such a bitch. It'd be really nice because I'm not the one that did this, but she can't. And again, but not realizing to to that the, is important. It's right. Like, I'm just going to love you through this because I know you're oh, hurting. It's, you know? Some days it's hard. Like, oh, sure. you're like, why are you coming throwing swords at me? And sometimes we have yeah. the pity party for ourselves, right. like as the spouse side. We're like, man, <laughs> I'm not doing it. I didn't do this. And all of a sudden, you find yourself being the only one they really can be mad at. You can't be mad at grandma. Mm. You can't right. be mad at Your brothers and sisters. You can't be brother, you know, mad at our kids. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I can be mad and they're going to forgive. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And But it, it, at the same time, when you're receiving yeah. that anger, you're like, damn it. Yeah. Like, where's the memory foam pillow? I'm going to just take <laughs> care of this real quick. Seven minutes later, I won't have this frustration. Right. But it, no, I mean, at the end of the day, man, it's it's a struggle. And to watch these people find their solace. And I think it's been an important part of trying to let her heal or watch her heal. And for her to heal yeah. is struggle is it's a struggle for, sure. for her. But also, I think she's found it to be super empowering as well. Okay. I might be speaking a little bit too soon. Yeah, this is not that long But at the same time, ago. she's in the middle of it every yeah. day. And I think whatever we can do to help people pause, I mm. think that's it, is learning the pause and teaching your kids to be bored. Mm. Let them just find that white space on their ceiling. That's and, how we get ahead of it. That's, you know? that's for sure. But then when it, it comes down to the actual trauma of life that will come to all of us, I mean, it is life. And it's a pain, good thing. Pain right? is a part of it. Yeah, like... Rumi has a quote, um, actually, I went to Deer Hollow in between the time I saw you last and I did this outpatient program there okay. um, to help me get a hold of all of this. Um, and uh, the, the theme of this program at Deer Hollow is I highly recommend. It's a PTSD program. Also substance abuse obviously goes along with that, but um, the cure for the pain is the pain. That's by Rumi. Um, and that's one that obviously doesn't make a lot of sense as a contradiction, but you have to sit with it and think about it while you're staring at the wall, right? Um, but for me... I think that, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you say it. Yeah. But then I think it makes it. a ton of sense when you feel it. Exactly. Like the cure for the pain is yep. the pain. And, and you bring to the, own it and the yep. breakdown, and then it actually breaks. It builds. Yeah. But we don't want to feel pain. Yeah. And that's, I think, part of our problem. Exactly. The avoidance of it, right? And that's where I was. Um, instead of accepting the reality of my situation i was doing everything i could to avoid it and to hurry up and rise above it or hurry up and fix it um and that just made it a lot worse right but when i was able just to sit with it and have compassion for it uh, that helped me um, realize what was happening and and it took me to a place that i could accept it um, but all this time I had to have space for that and I had to have some family and some, some loving support to help me have space for that. I mean, our relationship was tough, but it made me fo face all of this stuff, right? And it, it made me put everything on the table uh, as option um, to, to move through. And as I was getting trimmed down, I also got to know who I truly was. And, the, and like, honestly, seeing that and being truthful about that is how I can be sick right now and struggle to breathe and be okay with you not realizing that that's happening with me. Right. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times when we're hurting, we want it to be fixed and we want other people to know how we're hurting and why we're hurting and, and because we want people to help us bear it. But if we're making space for ourselves to hold it, you know, and, and using the support of uh, that higher source, um, ultimate concern, you know, our why, 
I think those are all things that help us expand our ability to hold it. And if we're taking time to rest in what we have and being grateful for it and, and working on that trust, then when that time comes, you know, that uh, the worst happens, then we'll have uh, a, a life raft, I guess you, you could say, to, to make it through. But it really is critical to have that support group and and the fact that Sarah was able to ha have compassion for me through that was key. So I guess a question would be, how do you s help other spouses, whether it be male or female, how do they find the patience in the pause where they just don't exit? It's so easy to get a divorce now. Right. We have a friend that's on her fourth, she's done, she's finished her fourth divorce. Yeah. I'm like, well, why don't you just call it breaking up now? You know what I mean? Like at this stage, why don't you just, call it breaking up because <clears throat> it's it's just so frequent and there's right. not she's not the oddball out there's a lot of people with that many right right so what made it so you had the, i mean obviously we have kids in the way and we're like hey i'm gonna hold on because i have kids in the way and i don't want them to suffer because i don't want to suffer yeah. so right just my, the simple gratification of i shouldn't have to be this i have the right to be happy i have this feeling that I, this is my she's the cause of my unhappiness so i can leave but at the same time to get my happiness causes some mm -hmm. sadness to my children and i think at least grown adults to a certain level. I shouldn't say that. Some people may take it wrong. I'm sorry, but uh, I mean, we, we still should have that pause that makes us really see if that's the source of the problem or is it because I don't want to go through the breakdown of the pain from my spouse. So just because they're hurting doesn't mean I should have to hurt too. What was your, what was your daily thought process? I guess, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So concept? something that helped me was, I, my parents are divorced. They've been divorced my whole life. So I know like kind of the both stories. So I know you can, mine was just like, choose your heart. Yes, I could go have an affair. Yes, I could go have the, like, you can choose what you want. Like, but that doesn't mean it's better. So I think a lot of people choose, like, they think it's the easy way or like, oh, but this person gives me attention and this person, or I could get divorced and go get remarried and have this and this. Okay. I don't really want that, <laughs> but I don't also want this like hard. So I think for me, choosing to like, and also taking res responsibility for my thing. I think we see that like people get divorced and remarried, but then those problems follow them. Uh, yeah. It Sometimes didn't fix it's it. Me, so it's like, right? maybe you should look at yourself. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. And Not all the time. It's right. Sometimes. Well, there's balance, right? And so it's like, you got to check your ego. I think marriage counseling was super awesome for us. We had a good counselor that. <clears throat> he could speak to both of us and I think you know we hear communication all the time but people really don't know how to communicate we've heard the five love languages people still don't know how to communicate with those we want to like receive love in the way that we give it and that's not like we all have our ways that we can see and hear things and so I think really getting to know each other and it's a journey because we ch you change right you probably are a different person than you were at 20 years old so oh, I'm so glad to. Well, right, <laughs> but like you have to keep changing and like moving together or you're going to grow apart is what we've kind of discovered. So, and then also just like knowing that you have a choice. You can get a divorce. You can stay in this marriage. You can do, like make bad decisions or you can make a good one for yourself. And so I think realizing that you're not trapped, like you get to choose every day if you show up in the marriage. And it doesn't mean a piece of paper, like for us, like, I think morally, like, uh, I'm so bad with words because my brain just gets, like, so emotional. But I don't think a piece of paper is, like, saying you're married or not. I think showing up every day in the relationship and choosing your spouse and their happiness, I don't want to say first, but just, like, that's important to you. But, par parallel. yeah, it's, like, I want him to be happy, too. And, like, I also want myself to be happy and, like, mutual respect He's the father of my children. He will forever be. I want this relationship to be good, even if we're in it together or not. So that's something that, like, I don't know, was freeing for me. I'm like, yeah, I, I could leave. So just, like, having that option. Yeah. No one's forcing you to stay. You're, I'm choosing. And then him also, I think, being willing to see, like, his issues, right? Like, I also had mine. He had his. But a lot of people are like, no, I don't. This is you. This is your problem. And just be like, okay, well, easy. we both have problems. You just have to mirror <laughs> it and say, it's all your fault. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm just responding to your issues. Right. I think you brushed over one key point and just like, choose your heart. Right. Like, because none of those pathways, staying married isn't easy. Right. And then 
getting divorced isn't easy. Nope. Having an affair isn't easy. Nope. I mean, sure, the action is easy, I'm sure, but the mental distress that it causes you and then the forever exactly. guilt that you have to struggle through isn't easy. And then what your kids are going to go through isn't easy. So it's like, which hard do you want? Mm -hmm. And which one's going to be the least amount of hard? And which yeah. one has the best opportunity for the best result? Exactly. Yep. And ultimately, we sometimes want to brush over what we're currently going through as truly the best opportunity for the best result to find something that may have an imme immediate result yep. for opportunity. Right. But then the longer leg of that could be so detrimental. Well, it goes back to your like the full circle of kind of like having a goal. It's like, yeah, I could get here really quick or you know, like that immediate gratification. And it's, that's not, you have to have that goal. Like, how do I want to show up in the world in all of the ways? So yeah. I don't know. I like. That. Yeah, there's a, I can't remember. I think it's like a Swedish proverb or something, but it's, if you want to uh, go far, go alone. If, or I mean, sorry, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And there was a while there where I was, my arrogant ambition was alone. I was, I want to go fast and I got hurt. <laughs> Right. And so there was a lot of this damage that I was already created. Right. And moving into this hurt space where I was being trimmed down to my bones of who I am and just writhing and, you know, squealing like a, I don't know. I, it was tough, man. And I like just dealing with the pain and showing up without that just agitation fuming from me has been a battle. And so being able to accept that as mine and see that the situation was not my creation i didn't create it and to know that i couldn't stop it right to know that i wasn't crazy allowed me to make space for the compassion that i needed to accept what was mine and to move more into like seeing it clear and and helping her see that i knew that it was mine and that way we can like in meditation separate the pain that's inside of me from you know emotional to physical in our relationship it's that similar kind of action that happens when we make that space we start separating this uh, enmeshed kind of pain that we've associated with the other person but it's just the circumstance it's just where life has led us and um, you have to do with what it is and and we got to make the best <clears throat> of it we got to make it good because that's what we're here to do and and finding that motivation within our relationship has led us into this place where it's way better than it ever could have been Way, so better. way better before than your injury and everything else. Yeah. You said this a couple times now, trimmed down to my bones. And mm -hmm. of course I knew you when you were this beef bust that all of us were frustrated with you on how you could just be this muscle mass. And then it looks it's like she doesn't really try. I and know. then you're watching me eat a hamburger and you're like, really? And I look at it and I'm getting fat, right? I'm like, Evan, quit eating hamburgers because I'm gaining weight. This is really driving me crazy. Yeah. And then down to a skinny guy of yeah. where you are. If it's not your fit and you look great. If oh. I could get down to that level, it would be really mm -hmm. nice. I'm Still, I'm down to a B cup. <laughs> so thank goodness I was a C. You're looking great. So I'm getting there. But nonetheless, when you say down, trim to my, you know, trim down to my bones, what you mean is truly trying to figure out who you are at your core and taking out all the outside mass mm -hmm. that was life. And now really not only being able to deal with what's hanging on right at your skeletal level yeah. and all the extra is now stripped down. Is go. that what you're trying to refer to? Yeah. When you're saying that? Yeah. Uh, to put it another way, um, there's this. Uh, this ancient saying, if you die before you die, then you will never die. Um, so oh, no, deep. <laughs> it is deep. So, <laughs> so if you die before you die. I've been thinking about this forever. Yeah. And so we go through these stages, our, our character, our personality, our ego, it's evolving, right? And if, if we're not changing, we're not allowing parts of us that needed to be let go and die so that we could be figuratively, metaphorically reborn into this new version of ourselves. And, and so that's the process that helped me get a handle on it mentally as far as what, what was happening. So everything that I wasn't was being stripped away. And, and then that forced me to try to find and figure out what has always been there. And without meditation, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And I, that's why every day, that's the one thing I, I can't live without. And it's integrated into everything I do now. Is it really? Mm -hmm. I've never meditated before. Might be something I need to try. Oh, well, wow. I think you have, you have, but you, 
not formally. Maybe right? not yeah. in the way that you, yeah. yeah. Like, Talking about the space. It. Listen, I can't fold my legs. No, I, and see, I don't like know how to hold my hands. That's what right? people think. I mean, that's what do. people think. So for me, I don't, I get, would get frustrated. I think it's different for where you're at in your life. But like mine is just sitting in the sun. You, I'm sure have sat in the sun and just be like, this feels nice. And you can just feel your body like, I need that. That's meditation. Like it can be something kind of simple. Thing. Feet, in the, yeah, yeah, grounding. It's a it's a way to separate um, that stimulus and response being intertwined, because you just tap into your senses mm -hmm. and it takes you right out of your head and you get into your body, and then that helps you access more of this higher awareness. I guess I refer to it as like get away from the noise. Yeah, like where's exactly. that part where you can just sit down and not have the noise? Mm -hmm. You know, like I tell all my friends, well, you'll know when I'm successful when I no longer have a cell phone. <laughs> right it's like why didn't you call me back I, mm. I don't know there was no pay phone and <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like I, I couldn't do that like uh, ultimately being able to be removed from the electronic leash that is mm -hmm. where you feel like if you don't have it you're going to miss out on an opportunity and opportunity means you're trying to make forward progress in theory I guess progress in whatever you want to take of it in the now and in the material world I guess yeah. but at the same time I think when you know that you've really made it is when you don't even know where your cell phone is and that you can just be at one with everything that you're around and whoever's trying to get a hold of you is going to have to wait till their turn of you being able to get a hold of them. Exactly. Right? And that's why the, the cure for the pain is the pain. Because when something happens, like when my dad died or when a parent passes away, and I'm sorry that your wife's going through that right now, I can feel that, I mean, it's excruciating because that's a part of you in a oh, lot sure. of ways. Um, but that that resets your idea of what is a priority in right. your life. It I was going to say that just like how I just think right now, like I know you work a lot, but maybe take 10 hours off work more, you know, show up for your wife a little bit more. She right didn't ask me to stay home today. It. She asked you to stay home. She goes, will you please stay home today? I'm like, I can't, I can't today. Like oh, today's a full day. You should have stayed home today. Well, I know, but I, again, it's, it's just, like, I, there's shoot. just so many pivots today yeah. that I just couldn't, like I was telling here, like, here's my window. I have 11 to one. And then mm -hmm. I have this time at one fifteen. I have 15 minute pauses theor theoretically built in, in between each break. Right. But at the same time, you truly want to be home. I'm like, oh, I think I could do it tomorrow if you want me to stay home tomorrow. But it was like, man, I'd like to stay home today. I don't mm -hmm. know the last time she said, Hey, stay home. Right. But at the same time, I'm like, I want to do it. And then at this, you've got all these other noises that you're trying to satisfy and, you know, 75 people that work directly here right. and you got to make sure that their families are properly fed and then learning how to properly delegate and pre-plan and making sure that you can just take a no call, no show day. I guess that's where I should be in my life where it's like, man, no call, no show. Yeah. Nobody knows the difference. And I, I'm pretty bad at it. Like I'll do Saturdays and Sundays. And so I've set my one, three, five, ten goals. Uh, I've been working with Brandon Dawson and Grant Cardone direct, and they've been working through some coaching, consulting, and some stuff on how to really set your targets and learning how to do that. We hired Randy Watt to come over and help us teach the benchmark of the mission, you know, like creating your mission and then benchmarking the, the steps along the way to your mission and then intertwining that into a goal set. Um, and really when it sits down and so you, you write out your goals and uh, the Dawson's use personal, professional, and financial goals, that was a really long challenge. That's good. I'm it glad took they included like the personal. Two months. It was for its first. Good. I was going to say that. I was like, I'm going to call you out right now and just financial. fire all of them because yeah. <laughs> right. I need you to go call your wife. <laughs> right, right, right. That's <laughs> like, it. So. Because I, I really is. Because you can have like this successful business, but if like you don't have your wife and family, like what is this? Nothing, Nothing. matters. Truly. It really yeah, 100%. doesn't. percent Like my dad, he was very successful. He was married and then now he has two houses, two bills, two motorcycles and no, not nobody to share it with. And, nobody and he said, he's like, my biggest regret is like taking my career first. Sure. And putting it first. And well, I, I never Steve found. Steve said that. I, I mean, yeah. Right, right on his deathbed. He's like, right? none of this matters. Didn't realize how much it does. So balance. Yeah. And and where does, I, I think that we're called to certain roles in life and we, we have to be a community and how we deal with those things. And some people are just asked to sacrifice more. And, and I think it has to be super individual, but the, the marriage has to be on board with that too, right? And that's how we keep first things first. I've been pretty lucky, I have to be honest. So she's been super understanding 90% of the time. Yeah. And I don't expect her to be 100, but she's been far more uh, appreciative or accepting. I don't know about appreciative. That's probably the wrong word, but accepting of what my personal goals are. But sometimes it's easy for us to say, hey, these are my personal goals. You've probably felt this and you're in the way of them. 
right? And then you hear a lot of the noise from other people. It's like, but you still need to be happy for yourself and don't let other people get in the way of your pers- of your personal goals, even yeah. if it's your spouse or your kids. You're yes. Like, Hold on just a second. Well, because truly if your first personal goals are here and they're, they're front layered with your wife, your kids, and so on, then professional and financial fall behind it. And truly, if that is the lead, then all the rest should be down wake. And I mean, yes, the bottom can lift the top, but it can't if you're lifting the top by yourself and it's absolutely opposite obje- or opposite objectives of your spouse or your kids. Like at some point you get home and you're like, well, my kids are grown. I said this to my wife the day before yesterday, I got home and I'm used, the sun was right and the temperature was right and I was used to like little Annie riding up on her bike with her little helmet and her pink nightie on. Going, <laughs> dad, you're home because it's off fire station, yeah. you know, and whatever, they don't get to see you. And, and her little friend would be behind her and waving. And I'm like, man, now I've got this, what is she she's gonna be 14 and uh all of a sudden there is no little helmet and pink nighty and kid running up to say dad you're home it's like hey baby how was your day and she's like fine dad like can i have a hug (laughs) sure (laughs) like dang it like where's this going (laughs) right so you want to rewind and hopefully they get out of the house soon and they can bring grandkids that do want to ride their bike up and say hey grandpa you're home kind of thing it's tough man i think it the the key is to be the stable spot right that they can find uh solace and peace when they're at their worst times um but i don't think we can be that unless we're doing like we're a team in it right unless we're both working towards the same objective and and our hearts are kind of unified in in the direction we're going because that is the energy i mean that is the energy that we do anything good in the world so i guess this would be a hard question to ask you guys because it I can't relate and I don't know that you can either, but then you have a lot of people that are by themselves that are going through that. And then that helps, or that does not just help, it escalates the depression, escalates the desire to end it and escalates the the desire to just feel like they're not contributing or I guess not desire, but the feeling that you're not contributing. And I think the sad part is, is some of the people that don't have or feel like they have the contacts don't realize that it may be just the guy at the grocery store that just checked you out. That is your guy. Mm. And there's a reason there's someone there, but at the same time, we can't see what we do have and what we are going to bring in the future and to rob the future opportunities of others that are going to benefit from our mindset that is bad right now right. and being able to share the story of where you're currently at you know now that you've gone through these steps you didn't know that you're going to be able to help others and like i said in the past your podcast has been by far the most downloaded by far wow. and so the, the comments come back of, of how positive it's helped them and if you look at all channels it's been a good thing and um you wonder why right it's like well it's a super sad story why do, do I want to listen to sad stories? But no, it was the underlying story of how it is relate. a sad story and how I can relate to that. And then as well as seeing that we're going to still keep trying and that you didn't follow up with your desires of like committing suicide or ending your yeah. life or ending your marriage or finding yourself into this lonely hole that sounds much more enjoyable mm-hmm. than being in the middle of a family and everybody else that I can't appease or, or help feed or help take yeah. care of because I'm no longer the caregiver. I'm now being cared I've been taken care of, which is an opposite role of the spouse, which I think would find it really hard, especially when you're a type A masculine, you know, personality. My God, it was hard like to, to move in a, from the sole provider into the the house husband role. (laughs) (laughs) I think I had a lot of like preparation for that. Um, But actually along the way, I really felt like even after my dad died in my life up to this point i don't feel like it's my life my story i feel like it's ours and like what's happening to me needs to be shared and i even feel like the all of the experiences has refined my ability to do that um and a lot of that has been updating what i thought life would be like and all these expectations that i thought um would come to fruition uh I, you know I, you probably thought this. A lot of people think when they're young, like, man, if I ever get stuck in a wheelchair, I, I just want to be done. I don't want to. And like Dan Cotter, wheelchair well, dad that I was telling you about the I, other day. I love his stuff. And, and I have a friend, his name's Kabir, and he's a quadriplegic. And he's like a huge source of light and goodness in the world, man. And anyway, so what a ridiculous thing that needed to be updated in my mind. Because now I feel so crippled. I, I feel I can't even wrestle with my kids. Like it, it is very, very painful on a daily basis to just live this life. 
<laughs> but I'm grateful for it, man. Like beyond belief, grateful for it. And the way that I see things now, I wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. I, without I wouldn't, the pain. Huh? Without the pain, without seeing how dark it could be and being forced to find light in the darkest place that you can, can imagine, right? Yeah. And that's what attunes our, our ability to see that light even when we're not in that dark place. So for your future, you're like, hey, I, I know I can give some opportunities and you have some plans to make the future yeah. a little bit brighter, not only for your, uh, yourself, but others, right? And I say for yourself, being able to teach mm -hmm. and being able to share helps I love unload this. it. Yeah. It helps unload what you feel every day and helps you understand what you're going through. Like when we were teaching ACLS or PALS or whatever, yeah. you learn more about you what it. you're yeah, teaching you teach than the people mm -hmm. listening to your teach. Right. So then at the same time, you're like, man, I want to teach this because I end up benefiting in the aspect of verbalizing and vocalizing and putting it into words and stories what I've gone through. And then I can go back and you find yourself building upon your own story based on your teachings. Yeah. So you've got some uh, plans to move forward. You have some, some ideas. plans. Yeah. Yeah. And regardless of my physical state, it still kind of in a downward kind of trajectory we've tried so many medicines that just aren't working and moving more into like a natural uh way um i'm kind of letting the medical system be to the side to support this natural uh, direction that i feel like i need to go in and, and a part of that i want to share it with people i want to share it with people that are struggling with similar things um and what sarah and i have been through she has ways to put things to words that i don't and she is a light in the world that I think <laughs> is amazing. And I, together, I, I, we, I think we could offer something that would really help people. And so we're thinking of putting a podcast together called uh, Pain's Purpose. And what an awesome name. Oh, you know, thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll do it weekly and just see where it grows. Well, it will grow. And if it, it'll start here with yourself. So no yeah. matter what, it's going to grow. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people or if it's one, then right. it's worth the time. <laughs> Truly exactly. just one. Exactly. Like if you can see the power of one and the multiplication of the one, so it's you. And then all of a sudden it's your wife and then it's your kids and then it's your kid's story and it's their kid's story. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this uh, hugely effective and dynamic tool. And they won't even know where it came from. Right. They, it's just a tool. Right. It's just like finding a hammer in your dad's garage that came to find out, you know, was three generations back, but it's still the exact same thing. They understand what it was. They know what it's used for. Yeah. And there's a story behind it. They just don't know what the real story behind the hammer. is. Exactly. That, that leads but, me back to the, the purpose behind the way the reason I got into firefighting. The reason I'm just upright even still is to show that you can be still after something like we've gone through and to show it to my kids mainly. Yeah. And to show that you can still have love in your heart. And despite any kind of physical limitations. Or governmental or limitations. Government, yeah, I mean, I mean, that was another thing that's frustrating about, to me. Despite yeah. any of that opposition, you can still show up. And you can still be the person that you're meant to be in the world. And you'll be okay if you're that. Yeah, if you bring out that's within you, that you're going to, like you were saying earlier, if that sense of purpose, if your soul is, is being fulfilled, then you can make it through anything. I guess the, the main question would be, how do you tell people that are struggling through it right now, what would be a good source for someone to just find pause? What would be your first, what was your first reach of pause when you hit that first, like, I'm done with this? Yeah, so getting on a program that helps you make space every day is what I did. And so uh, I started with Headspace, and they have a pretty good progression. It's science-based. What's Headspace? It's just a, an app. Um, meditation app. yeah they teach meditation and it starts with a couple minutes and then you'll find I, I think it's my experience anyway that over time you'll you'll want it and it'll be kind of like a, a source of nourishment uh, that you depend on um, but it, it and then you can tap into that resource and that nourishment when the dark times come so that's what we do ahead of time to build it up um, but when you're in that moment and you haven't had all that done, you have to humble yourself and accept where you're at and ask for help. Yeah. That's what you have to do. I think where you get down to the point where you literally put the barrel in your mouth, the pills in your mouth, the rope around your neck or the knife to your hand, the, the big concern is how do we find the stop? 
Like, right. I was lucky enough that I ended up being stopped by somebody else, third party that finds me in the middle of nowhere on a mountain in the middle of nowhere yeah. and knew exactly what I was doing. Not because he was there on accident, just because he was out there wow. messing around with somebody else and said, Hey, there's this truck. Oh, well, I relate this truck to where his cousin, you know, went off a cliff. So we want to make sure what's he doing down there. That's a weird wow. deal. So they walk down a trail, find you in the middle and say, no, you're not. No, you're not. And then the next day wow. down to the Great Salt Lake thinking, okay, if they're finding me on the mountain, I'll go to some other place in the middle of nowhere and they won't find me there. And the same kid finds you the next night because That's they're doing the same thing. No. And then at that point it was easy for me to say no, but I think if it wouldn't have been the pause, obviously there was the pause waiting, right? You're sitting there. I couldn't tell you how long it was saying, mm -hmm. I don't want to do, do this anymore. But I, it was a good enough pause and knowing that I needed to be intercepted in the middle of it because it wasn't something that I was going to be stopping on my own. Yeah. That I was able to have a fortunate someone. I mean, truly Takes humility has to be up in the middle of, you know, I mean, way oh, up the sure. mountain. There's no reason for anybody to be up there at two in the morning. So in the middle of a dirt trail, wow. in the yeah. middle of a mountain. So remembering right. stories like that, right, is key. Um, and knowing, looking back, okay, I have been guided, I've been supported, I've been, you know, sustained, right? And, and these are the ways. So trying to maintain an awareness of those in that moment. But for me, like I, ever since my dad died, I haven't had like a fear, a huge fear of death. Like I was pretty reckless growing up. If it was good enough for him, it was good enough for me. Sure. And he was there, so it'd be fine. But uh, now I, I'm here because I'm a dad and a husband and the ripple effect you talked about. Or a son or a daughter. Oh, yeah, all of that, right? The friend. ripple effect of, of a suicide, right. I've seen it, I felt it, and it's crushed me. Yeah. And I'm not gonna do that to, to anybody. And they say it's selfish, and I can, you know, that you hear that pretty common, it's easy to say. And it's hard to, because it's Sometimes a selfish mindset. Sometimes you just wanna be selfish. It's a se selfish mindset, sure. right? Like I want out, and I'm in pain, and I want out. Um, and in that moment, we depend on God, man. I think that's, that's really that's what it comes line. down to. Yeah. And to remember that it is a selfish mindset. And sometimes those people do want to be selfish. They're like, yeah, I want to be selfish. I'm here and I'm going to take care of my own desires, my own, this, I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't have to. And it's true, you don't. Yeah. But the bottom line is, is the reason it is selfish is you're robbing the opportunity for people to learn from this lesson that you're living today. Yeah. I think that story that you're going to be able to share from your lowest point is more impactful than the greatest story of your biggest success. If you're able to verbalize it and able to teach and able to share and able to express and then have other people have a pause as well and learn quiet and learn peace. I, think. Well, that, I feel like, see, and I think a little bit differently. I don't think that person's selfish. I think they're in so much pain that they can't just see it clearly. Stop. They just want it to stop. So in my like motherly instinct, I just like want to love that person. Mm. You know, it's hidden. We don't know who's feeling that at that time, but I've had, we've had multiple family members that have done that. We even had one that, um, this, I don't know, the trigger warning, but like he hung himself and then, um, his dad found him and then they took him to the hospital and then he was like unconscious. He had the breathing tube and everything, but he opened his eyes and you could just see it in his eyes. And there's just like guilt. Like he didn't want to do that. Right. Ugh, makes sure. me sad. Um, and I, you know, I had a friend or brother, same, same situation. She felt like he had came to her after he passed and was like, I'm so sorry. Like that's not what I wanted. So I don't think they're in their right mind. It's that pain that is overtaking them. And they just wanted to so, stop. And they just wanted to stop. And so I think we all have that inner child inside of us that just, we got to figure out how to how, let them have a voice and have them be loved. And like, it can go even to like your wife struggling right now. Her inner child is like, oh, my mom, like, I just want my mom. And it's like, oh my gosh, let me just love you. I can't fix it. All I can right. do is just love you. And kind of full circle back to like what you asked me about Evan, like, what did you do? That was one thing I thought of him as one of my kids and not in a bad way, but I was just, I saw his little, his little tantrums, like that might your child might do right when they're upset, like kick and punch and do things just like, Sometimes we do that as I've adults. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we do oh, yeah. act out as adults and it's like, sometimes we lose our shit and it's okay. Like, but just seeing that and knowing like, where's that coming from? Okay. What, like, let's meet your needs. Like, let's figure out what's going on really inside of you. It's hard to put to words. And so going back to like the communication, like, what are you feeling? What are you struggling with? And yeah, we all have childhood trauma. Might not be like our dad, you know, all like Evans, but it's like we all have those things that hurt us and we have to just, I think, acknowledge them, give a voice to them, figure, 
figure them out now so we all don't have like midlife crisis like every time someone's getting a divorce or having an affair I'm like oh man what happened to them as a child and like it's kind of almost laughable because there is something or like needs not being met or daddy issues or just different things that you can totally see it and if we don't just fix it like yeah when we're like be aware of it I guess and don't cover it up because you guys are really good at doing that. <laughs> guys, guys yeah, are good. Well, like I think just like your firefighters. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just maybe it's a personality type and like you well, pick that. It's part of the job. I mean, you, yeah. you can't and you show have to go to the next wounded. call. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, how can I help you? Hold yeah. on. You can't even walk. You can't. Right. <laughs> and I don't mean that. And that probably sounds like really mean. No, but it's no, just it like what you That's guys right. are really taught to do. And it's like the exact, exact opposite in my mind. Like yeah. you have to talk about that call. Exactly. Like it seems like the only ones you guys talk about are little kids. Well, all of those hurt, but if you have, you know, a teenage daughter, like if you have something that you can relate with, like it's going to hurt worse. Like, mm -hmm. right. Like if you have that 14 year old daughter at home and you go to a 14 year old suicide, you're going to, that's going to hit you different than it might hit Evan. Sure. So, so I just think it, acknowledging. Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to no, cut you off. I'm done. I was just going <laughs> to say that it's so key what you're saying and to be able to be that person for your, somebody else. You have to be with that person for yourself first. You have to be asking those questions to yourself first. Like, where is this uh, behavior coming from? Why am I seeking this candy, you know, or, or why do I run to blame? Um, what is this pain that I'm trying to run from? What, what is this discomfort? Where is it coming from? And, and figuring out how to be honest with about that allows you to have compassion for other people because we're all capable of the terrible things that have been talked about. You know, and it, it is a matter of awareness and uh, self-compassion. And then with that, we can hold maybe a, a container, I guess you could think of, or just space for right. other people. And that can get bigger and bigger and bigger depending on how much we're able to hold within ourselves. And there's, man, there's enough to sit with for a lifetime within just me. Right? Sure. Well, you've been a lifetime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then plus the story that compounds that most people don't ever have to go through. And I want to clarify selfishness. I think selfishness is what I'm trying to express. It's not them being selfish. It's the selfish act of robbing other people of the opportunity you can teach. I to totally sympathize and I've been there again. If you pulled that action off, what was selfish? Well, it was, of course, I guess it was a selfish act in the sense, but of course you're hurting so bad that you're just wanting it to stop. Yeah. But ultimately, what is the selfishness means? I, I'm going to miss out on the opportunity of all those great things that you could have taught me mm -hmm. from this lesson you've gone through. And I, you, you pointed out another thing. is like finding out the why, right? There's a thing I like to ask myself. I try to put pause in. What is the question before the question? So why? And then what's the why that created the why? So the question before the question, you can continue that path all the way down several times. Question before the question, before that question, before that question, to find the root cause. Mm -hmm. So when somebody walks into your office and blows up and they're frustrated and stressed out, and you're like, hey, your check is four days late. I had this argument the other day. I'm like, dude, how much do I pay you? It was like a, over a million a year at this particular vendor. And I'm like, man, how much do you do with anybody else? Well, hardly any. And well, you guys normally always pay on time. Like we blow into my office and you have this fit and we're four days past due, wow. but you can see that this check was dated prior, prior to that. Well, how come I didn't get a wire? Well, we typically do wires, but my CFO was out of town and it takes two point of verification. She's Europe time. I'm Utah time, which I don't have to explain. It's payment is payment. It's like, well, I couldn't afford these type of delays. I'm like, I understand, but now you blow through my front door. Let's dig, let's dig into what, what's going on. Well, as we've learned, we started, you know, maybe 200,000 a year and have expanded the company's, uh, at least our own small vendor, 3000 square foot vendor purchases to like a million bucks. Yeah. To over a million and well as the pay as our business grows at 20 30 40 percent a year for him well all of a sudden his output is required to go further right which then means his payables gets extended yeah. and not because the time frame is extended but the credit usage amount so as you run the math and i just did this after i'm like well, why is he freaking out and you break it out on a piece of paper and you can see well it's because he's never realizing his net profit our growth is outpacing his net profit. Mm. So he never gets to capture and realize the gain as our orders are increasing 
every month. It is yeah. his percentage of margin that he never gets to realize. So, so hence, as he's building up his back stock, and I think as dumb of that relationship is, it, it's the same thing. It is. As our experiences grow, the difficulties get bigger, and then all of a sudden someone blows into your room and says, all this stuff, well, it's this that compounding effect of life experiences that really throw us for a loop and don't under, we can't understand why we're freaking out because we're supposed to be in such a better place if right. you look at where we sit today yeah. this is why well, we're five times bigger in just a few years or we're in a five times better place but why am i not feeling like i'm any better as a matter of fact i feel worse why and i, I as i broke down this this wasn't with my vendor this was just me going what would cause this guy to come blowing in here? Like See, I would have a hard time. What goes to my mind is I'm like, well, what happened to that guy last night? Like, I, like taking you out, like sure. it's not personal, right? Even though it probably feels personal. Like it, he probably had a bad night. Personal. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I just think like, I don't know. That's just different how my brain works now. Cause I'm like, oh, what, is, what are you going through? Well, yeah, I thought, I mean, <laughs> it was a good point. example of what you were pointing at, but also you were pointing at how you hold space for other people and how to do that. It, you, you don't just look at the behavior, you look at the individual and the context of the situation like you did. And I think that's how we build these powerful relationships that, that help people build a container big enough to hold what you have now, right? And what we call life, yeah, right? And all of us, we, we're gonna be given everything we can handle. And I don't think we're giving much more than we can handle, even though it feels like we can. It's just the breakdown period of trying to understand or increase our container size. And I think the exercise and the thing that you can probably truly deliver and what I think will be interesting to learn is how to build your container. Like we don't know, we're not promised tomorrow. And I guess sometimes the fortunate side of if you do get in a fatal accident, you don't have to deal with whatever on an individual deal. But if you're not, and you have to learn with a new reality that doesn't allow you the tools to do your, your normal actions to be able to provide, and you have to learn a whole new skill set, not just the skill set of the action, but mm -hmm. the mental skill set of yeah. being able to do it yep. is something that I think would be a, a powerful lesson to learn. That is actually mm -hmm. something that I've been wanting and, and planning to share too. So th there'll be, I think, in this design that we have um, a lot of uh, stories from our experience, but we also plan on bringing in other people to see how they're dealing with their their jobs on the front line. Uh, we we want to have a segment called Frontline Pulse Check, where we talk to teachers, uh, you know, first responders, fire wives, fire wives, fire wives. parents, even cop wives. I've got my good group. Versus yeah, doctors. Yeah, cop wives. yeah, just to to see how they're holding their center and how they're making more space in their container because we have to learn from one another yeah. if we're going to be able to be dynamic in this complexity that we're all trying to live in. I think this is going to be such a powerful tool for everyone to have. I, you know, and then you can kind of explain through that story of all the different difficulties you've had to do just to deal with what you feel like would be someone that's supposed to be there. As you pointed out, you felt like, you know, departments and cities should yeah. be there and stepping up. But then you quickly learn that they're not they, they don't yeah. want to take a bullet for anyone. They're just trying to get to their 20 year or 25 year retirement mm. and exit and don't want to be in the way. And nobody has your back and you feel yeah. felt left alone. But I think that's a powerful thing that needs to be expressed and taught as well, where we don't give and build so much confidence in third party that we can't control. And I guess this is through life too. Like we've got to realize that that third party, as simple as an insurance company, life insurance, let's call mm -hmm. it that that when you're ready to have use of it, then all of a sudden you find no access. And yeah. you're like, well, wait, I've been paying into this my whole life. Where are you? And to build up the sense of, you know, maybe that'll work, the hope that it works, but then the back line of, well, yeah. let's build everything as if it doesn't. Kind of a primary, secondary, and tertiary level lever. Yeah. Like if this works, this is great. So this is my primary level. Well, yeah. if that doesn't work, then I have a secondary opportunity that this doesn't work. This is my secondary plan. But then to remember, we should have a tertiary plan too. If our primary and secondary levers fell, yeah. we should have a third lever. And none of those outside of the first one are optimal. They're yeah. just the backup plan, mm -hmm. right? I call those. Yeah. I, I, like well, your plan A and B and mine's like X, Y, Z. What's your X, Y, Z? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of A, B, C. You're like, okay, yeah. we'll just go. We'll go down <laughs> to, to the end of the alphabet. Yeah. Here. Exactly. So. Yeah, I think it, I hope that we can bring something to the table that will be helpful with some of those things because right now systems as they are, they are serving themselves. They're not serving the people and they're not 
representing the country as, as I was taught it was meant to be. Um, so that is a hope, but I think how we do that is by empowering the individual because it is the individual that makes up the system and it is all of us that's responsible for the terrible legislation for, you know, retirement in Utah. We all need to say what we think is true and we need to stand up for it despite the system's negative, um, influence. Well, the hard part is, is nobody dares have a voice. And that's why I love to stand up for our public service. Everybody, if you guys need help, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to take the realm. I'm happy to help fight the horns. Like it doesn't matter to me. I don't rely on it for their retirement. I don't rely on it for my insurance. I don't rely on it for my paycheck. I don't care, right? As far as that is, and I'm not actively, you know, taking paychecks, but at the same time, the concern that you have is when you get into a situation where they do control your paycheck, they do control your in health insurance, your retirement and your potential injury, right? Yeah. Um, you can't say anything for fear of retribution, which becomes problematic. And I think, you know, we have what they call in spirit, the whistleblower law and whatever that applies to, but we've all known people, you know, Ian Nelson that got hammered on a whistleblower, got fired from Oregon County from that, mm. just by tattling on council members that were cheating the system and stealing from the, the taxpayers. Yeah. He turns them in, and uh, we had to step up and afford the lawsuit to take down Morgan County, which he ended up ultimately winning. Wow. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's how do you empower people that are truly making uh, just enough to get by in this in current economic environment? And most of them aren't making enough to get by, so they work two jobs or overtime to try to do it. I think w- to have people understand one, that they need to start talking and they need to do it in a, at a group level and even outside of a union, you know, Utah's yeah. unions are useless anyway, right? And not just to criticize, right? We're all good at that. I mean, sure. the negativity bias is what we're prone to. That's how we've evolved to be where we are now. Mm-hmm. What we need to do is use our creativity, our higher awareness and our tact yeah. to put things in a way that's productive because it's easy to tear things down. Systems we, are ugly and they're terrible right now. It's easy to point at potential presidential candidates and, and say all of these things. Right. Um, but, but I think what you're saying, it's exactly true. We have to start saying really what we think is true, right? Not just what we think is popular or not going to get us in trouble or it's ridiculous that cities teach in HR not to retaliate against complaints. Right. But then these big, and then the cities do it. And they retaliate. <laughs> yeah. they, they threaten your your promotion. They threaten your you know job com- all the way your down. Job. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So. And I like how you said it would be important not to do it in a negative way. There is ways to approach this stuff positively, mm-hmm. and then doing it in a way that people don't fear feel fear. Now they're going to inherently feel fear yeah. of whatever you're trying to do that could put them at some type of an exposure level. But I think even if you're in the government chair, whatever seat that may be, city council, county council, state level, I, I think at some point you need to realize they're not attacking you as an individual. No. They're just wanting to question the system and see how they are protected and what more, not that they're asking for more, because yeah. I don't think it's at any point, even for yourself, that you're asking for more than what you were expecting, but to get the minimum of what you expect or what you understood. What was promised. Right? What was, yeah, and even if it's written down, verbally promised or whatever, I don't care what you do, I do, do what you say. Yeah. Right, at some point, if that's what you've led people to believe, and here's another one, if, if it's a no, then explain to me how I misunderstood it to where it is a no, like I'm okay with no, but make sure that the no is an understandable no. Yeah, but the problem is uh, the systems inherently take care of themselves, right? So when somebody's hurt like I was, unable to find my voice because I was distraught and suicidal. And uh, fear of being forced to fire. Yeah, losing everything that I've worked all of my life to get my family was on, you know, on the line too. And that's why I was like, the job is definitely, you know, I I had to quit, I had to focus on getting healthy for them. well, retire. Um, so the fact that it takes it, the system takes advantage of people in that circumstance by not get, like not giving them a voice in the first place, but also not allowing them to give feedback to improve that system without that kind of feedback, there isn't any improvement. And our country is kind of founded on that. So if you have these corporations that are deciding the laws and none of the workers are represented there because of whatever reasons or not represented well enough, then we end up in a situation that most injured workers in Utah are. 
right? There's a lot of them. And I think you bring up a good point too, where we find ourselves trying to run from negative feedback. And when I think as an individual, if, if, and I could do better at it, but I try to capture it, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do my best to accept and appreciate the negative pushback. Like I think negative, not just pushback, but negative feedback is a good thing. I think at the same time, it gives you an opportunity to reflect and how do you make better project products if all we hear is the compliment on the product. And the product, I don't mean just a door. I mean a job, a yeah. benefit package, a place to work, whatever yeah. it may be, a better yeah. home. What is negative but feedback? I but, need negative. But, but pain, right? I mean, it's just, it's a painful it thing hurts to, hear. to hear. Yeah, but, but what are we supposed to do with it? Are we like... I think they're doing what most people do with pain. They just kind of push it away. They ignore it. They, they cover it up with whatever, right? And instead of uh, sitting with it and receiving the information that it has so that we can move forward in a more productive and peaceful and in, in, yeah. in, a, in a way that actually fulfills the intention of the system. I think I've taken it a little bit on the far side for me. I've used a statement like fell fast, fell frequent. Right, I try to fail as fast as I can and as frequent as I can. <laughs> I truly do. Like really? I want to fail as fast as I can. And I use the Britney Spears story. Like, if you're a person, and I don't, it's nothing against her, but she had been a rock star for her whole life, from being a Disney star all the way to where she just failed once, and then you see her collapse and all the way to the bottom, and she it taken it's taken forever to get out of. Well, cliffs. The bigger the cliff, the longer you've waited to fall or you've experienced a fail the harder the fall is. Mm -hmm. So if we can appreciate a fall in eight inch increments, it doesn't hurt near as bad. We may sprain an ankle and point. we can learn from it, but it's not casted and we can improve. So when I go home every day, I'm, and Nephi could probably to attest to us sitting on this side, but I, I look for what's wrong all day. I wanna find a fail and I wanna capture it and I wanna see how we fix it. And I spend probably a little bit too long into the opportunity of trying to fail, like looking for what's the fail and wanting to fix the stuff. Because you can get ahead of it too much. Because I, right? I wanted it. Well, and it doesn't get, sometimes I try to fix something that hasn't even had time to be able to, you know, to simmer enough to like be break truly all the an way. example, <laughs> right? So it, it is a struggle for me, and I do yeah. love the fell part, and I think I like the fell part a little bit too much. I think that's why we get along, maybe. <laughs> it's almost masochistic, right? If, if I'm not suffering, then I'm not growing kind of thing, That's maybe. totally me, yeah, right? if I'm but, not suffering. But the, what you're saying, there's some good in there uh, that... I think is really, really important kind of talking to what we're, what we're here speaking to. And it, it is the feeling what you're feeling. Just feel what you're feeling right then. If you put it off and you're not going to feel it, then you're going to feel it at some it's point. Gonna really if you're asking somebody else to feel it for you, like a parent, a spouse, at some point they're going to say no, and they're not going to feel it anymore. I mean, it's going to all when be it's on too you. Much for them, it's going to be that, that thing. whole cliff. But if you could just feel that day by day, what's yours and try your best to determine what's yours then I think, well, I feel pretty confident that you won't get in a position where your life you say, is, is in kind of jeopardy. I like how you say to feel what's yours. Because I one thing my wife does is she finds blame for everything that has nothing to do with her. Like, oh my gosh, they, they fired so-and-so. And this is an exaggeration. But at the county, um, I wonder what I did wrong. I'm like, shit, you don't even work there. <laughs> Like, why are you taking ownership for something else that you had nothing to do with? Like, hey, this person, this was an experience like uh, one of her brother-in-laws, you know, had overdosed, drank too much and fell and hit his head. And she's like, well, I probably, I felt like I should have called. Why didn't I call? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So she tries to take ownership she takes too for much. everything. Yeah. Well, then there's some kind of like that. I'm like, stop. It's not yours to take. Yeah. Now you're trying to take away from other things. Well, a gift there's a, a balance, right? Mm -hmm. So thank goodness she's like the most wonderful spirit on the planet. But you know, the same you know what that is? is? For me, I can relate to her because when it came to me and Sarah, I tried to fix it because I, I wanted all of the problems to be mine, I think, in a way. Obviously, I didn't because I opposed that too. But sure. the control side of me that wanted to have everything, you know, neatly set out in front that, okay, she's going to be there for me. You know, all these things that we we want selfishly without considering the other person. Uh, so we, we just try to take it all. If, if it's my problem, then I can fix it and I can make it better and we'll be fine. But if we don't give people what's theirs to fill, then we're going to confuse ourselves with what we need to do next and with the changes we need to make. And that person will have no basis to go off of because we're not reflecting back the truth. You know, the one bad part about being masochistic, is that what that word is? Yeah. That sounds really hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, you, you've took it, you've taken the, or you have taken the 
good off of it, but you forgot to take the bad. You said, oh, I want to fix what I can fix. But what you're saying also is I want to feel the pain because I deserve it. There's that. You're, you're like, hey, I want the pain. You're not letting them have it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I want to, I I think I deserve the pain. Give me the pain. Yeah, you get the the fix, but you also are taking the bad. Yeah, you're reinforcing that Which you're just trying to punish yourself more. And I don't think that's necessarily fair either because those other people need to feel it. Mm. And I get frustrated at the point like, this isn't yours to take. Yeah. Like a little bit of that should be their family, their parents, their, their loved ones or themselves, right? At, at some point you, and, and I, she's going to defend herself as she should, but I'm like, you need to let people have theirs too. And yeah. you're trying to steal the pain. And then you find yourself in this hole where you feel sad. Yes. You're wondering how you can fix it. Well, obviously this you're not fixing. You can be there to the funeral on Saturday, yeah. but you're not fixing the overdose. So why are you trying to take it? At some point, it's just more damaging. And I think, bless her heart, and that's what's made her be so such a wonderful human. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, man, you've got to pick and choose your battles. And I yeah. think there's a lot of sad people on the planet that end up becoming sadder on things that are way beyond their control and don't belong on their shoulders, even though they've taught themselves. And back to your point, what's the question before the question? Maybe there was a childhood thing that the parents blamed everything on them. So now everything is their fault, regardless of how much relationship they have to that problem. Mm -hmm. So just you, her realizing that is super important, though. Like, that's not hers to carry. Oh, she hasn't realized it yet. It's like, <laughs> she's probably some sort of an empath where it's like, it's a gift and curse. Like, I have a coworker like that, that she's, like, so sweet, and you're just, like, she can just feel everything you're feeling, and you're like, oh, my gosh, she just can, I can tell, and your eyes water up when you tell a sad story, but then it's almost too much because then she, yeah, she carries it, and it's a can The next issue, I didn't sleep anxiety. all night, I cried all yeah. night, and I don't know how to fix your problem, I've yeah. thought about yeah. it. Yeah, and you're well, like, okay, pause, that's not your to fix. <laughs> there's so sorry. much good there. No, don't be sorry. Uh, there's, there's like, be, our communities lack that, yeah. I think, feeling what other people feel and being there with other people in their pain. I totally It's do. just hard to orient it, right, because uh, it really is an impulse to be a part of the community and to, to hold what life is here for us to hold right and i mean as far as i I had a really good friend that committed suicide and for a long time i knew that i needed to call him our good friend that was a mentor to him another father figure his dad died when he was young so this mentor was like so important to him and he died and then i i'd been too caught up in my own thing and i didn't give him a call so there's this small aspect of the choice that he made to take his own life that I could have offered some sort of light to, not to say that he would have changed his mind or would have made a difference in the end, right? But this is how we move forward, I think, as a community. We have to be aware and accept the little pieces that are ours and learn how to differentiate and discern um, when we're caring too much or just shrugging off the world and not caring, you know, not caring what's happening in China or Africa, uh, that sort of thing. So anyway, what about our neighborhood, our family? I mean, that's where it starts. Yeah. And that, I, I think for me, a good definition of the will of God is, is it good for me? Is it good for my family? Is it good for the community? Is it good for the country? You know, is it good right. for the world? And then uh, I can and go out as far as you want. And then, I mean, that's a good compass that has helped me get to this point. And like you said, purpose drives us through the hardest times like we've talked about and and part of my sense of purpose is showing up right now right here to have conversations like this and many more and many more so that we can uh build on this and and see how far we can take it and how much good we can bring when are you going to start right now this is first this is first here we go right thank you and then so starting next week you're doing another one yeah ready to roll okay there you go bring it on what else do you guys have you want to keep going or do you want to bring it on to the next one Let's What's just, your thoughts? Let's just start with that. Let's, let's just, start with that. Let's start with that, man. One All right. Little baby What's your 10-year plan? <laughs> What's your 10-year plan? <laughs> let's do Show it. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening. Again, Evans Fitzgerald, Sarah, his wonderful wife. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I guess next week, here it rolls, and we'll, yeah. we'll share. Make sure you guys follow, listen, and then uh, go ahead with the title again. Yeah, that's uh, Purpose. Pain's purpose. Pain's purpose. Yeah, said it enough yet. Pain's yeah, purpose. Said enough. <laughs> thank you for having us. I really appreciate it all of your time and all of the support that's uh, physical and, you know, all of it. Thank yeah, you. I'm always here. Phone call away. Frustrates 
you know, my wife sometimes, but I'll take it. Not yours, but <laughs> I'm like, listen, I'll take whatever. I'm happy to be there. I think it's that immediate responder thing. Like, I'll be there. Yep. What do you need? When do you want it? I'll yep. be there and drop everything. But I get that from my wife. She's the first one that will respond to anything. So love you guys, and hopefully see you here in a week, right? Love Go you. and do your thing. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Hopefully, there was a takeaway for you. If you like what we're doing or even our efforts, tell your friends about it. Let us know what we can do better. Again, thank you for listening to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button.